and Savior Jesus Christ, and on behalf of his council, welcome all of you as we continue our worship of the Lord uh, in this afternoon hour. This morning, I, I did fail to mention or to draw your attention more specifically to the Reformation rally. Our church, our congregation is hosting it, is organizing it, and it would be good to, to see some uh, good attendance from our congregation there as well. The Ref rally is Friday, October 27th at Redeemer's, so do please put that in your bulletin or in your calendar. Shall we then stand to hear God's call to worship? The end of Psalm 68, the psalmist writes, O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, ascribe power to God whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He's the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Let's take a moment of final preparation and silent prayer as we answer this call. Shall we pray? Congregation left by our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. From the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. We're going to sing now from Psalm 68. We're going to sing all of 68b and then do please stay standing after the singing of Psalm 68 be for the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. So 68b, the stanzas 1 through 4.
Church of all ages and of all places, let's confess a rundown Catholic and apostolic faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And our song of response will be 253, the stanzas 1 and 4. prayer, just a note for your prayers in this coming week. Uh, remember Rennie Pott uh, in your prayer. She was hospitalized um, the, towards the end of last week, uh, and so we do want to keep her in prayer as well. Should we come to the Lord then in prayer? Merciful God and Father, we come before your throne of grace to praise you this day, to give thanks to you, for you are good. And your steadfast love endures forever. Indeed, who can utter the mighty deeds that you have performed or fully declare all your praise? For what you have done, Lord, is so often beyond our comprehension. What you are accomplishing is so often beyond our ability to discern. There is a mystery that lies over your plans and providence that sometimes baffles us, sometimes confuses us, sometimes challenges us. And then, Lord, in time we are able to look back and to see how all of these different threads form a beautiful tapestry and display Your glory in all the earth. We pray, Heavenly God and Father, that You would help us in response to the truth that we know that that You are sovereign and that all things are happening not by chance but by Your fatherly hand. Help us who know these things, Lord, to observe justice and to do righteousness at all times. That is to thank and praise You for what it is that You have accomplished on our behalf, and to thank and praise You with lives lived in praise of Your name. Indeed, we pray, Lord, that You would remember us each day in this coming week, and that You would remember to show favor to us as we serve You in our various callings and places at home, at school, in the classroom, as teacher or student, 
as those who work in offices, who work with the public, who work on a job site, Lord, there are many different places that you have planted us and called us to use our gifts and talents to advance your cause and your kingdom. And we pray that you would help us in those places to indeed live and serve under the banner of Jesus Christ, and that you would work in us and through us to also shine that light to the world so that others may come to know and serve you, that they might rejoice with us in your faithfulness and in your love. Indeed, we pray, Lord, that you would so bless your church in this way that we would rejoice in the prosperity of your chosen ones, in the gladness of your people, in the glory of your inheritance. We know, Lord, that we do not deserve any of these things, for we have sinned, have committed iniquity, have done wickedness. Lord, this is the story of your people, your people who long ago, when they even saw your power at work in Egypt, yet committed iniquity, did not consider your wondrous works, did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. The moment they faced their first real trial as they stood on the banks of the Red Sea, they forgot you. And they rebelled by the sea. Yet you were gracious and good to them. You saved them for your name's sake. You saved them so that others might know that you are the God of mighty power. And when you rebuked the Red Sea and it became dry, when you led them through the deepest, through a desert, and saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy, You proclaim to all the world that you are the living God, that you are the God who does more miraculously, more wonderfully, more awesomely than any that we can imagine. Indeed, the gods of the world are are empty, meaningless, pointless gods, and those who worship them are like them. Indeed, on that day so long ago when you saved your people through the Red Sea, then the waters covered their adversaries. Their gods were not able to save them from the flood that ran over them, and over their heads. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see how much more meaningful and powerful is your saving grace in our lives. For you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, not to part the Red Sea, Lord, that we might walk on the sea in dry feet, but to to part the the very presence of hell itself and the place of death. You have opened a way through that dark corridor so that we might enter into glory. And Lord, even as your people on the banks of the Red Sea, after they followed through and were standing on the other side, safe and secure, even as they praised your name, help us to praise your name. And help us to not forget your works. Help us to not wait for your counsel. That too is what we learn from your people throughout redemptive history. A people that are so quickly distracted, so quickly unable to remember what it is that you've done. The Israelites in the, in the desert, Lord, crying out for food, putting you to the test, demanding water, being jealous of your leaders, making a calf in Horeb, and worshiping a metal image. Lord, the story of your people throughout redemptive history is the story of their failure to trust, especially in hard times. Especially, Lord, in those moments where we come to the limits of our ability, when we come to the weakness of our flesh. And there we are reminded that we have no hope save for You. And we are reminded, as You reminded Your apostles so long ago, who pleaded with You for that thorn to be removed, that Your grace is sufficient. And that in our weakness, Your strength is revealed. Indeed, it is in our weakness, Lord, that we experience most keenly the power of Your saving love, even as Your people did long ago. For though You were angry with Your people, and though You delivered them into the hands of enemies, and though You punished them with rods from the nations around, yet You were always faithful. And for the sake of Your covenant, for the sake of your people you remembered your covenant and you delivered to them mercy and grace and saving power and even we know our lord need that same grace to be at work in our lives now because we live in a world full of idolatry full of wickedness full of temptations full of sin 
And your church, O heavenly God and Father, is hard put to by their enemies and by those that oppose. Not only, Lord, in philosophical ways, in technological ways, our brothers and sisters, Lord, in the world are, some of them are under persecution, some of them are living in fear of discovery, of being found out to be those who follow you. We pray for those brothers and sisters in particular and pray that you would keep them safe and bless them. But that you would also keep us safe. Lord, our, our persecution, our trial is not the same. It's certainly not as severe and we acknowledge that. We live in great wealth and plenty. We live in great blessing. We don't want to diminish that. We are grateful for the peace and prosperity of our nation. We are grateful for a structured government, for an orderly society. We're grateful for so many of the many blessings that we enjoy as citizens in this land. But we do see, Lord, the changing seasons of our society. We hear the policies that are debated in parliaments. We hear the decisions that are made by those thought leaders and those societal influencers. And we shake our heads and we wonder how it can be that anyone would have thought this would be normal, that this would be ordinary even just a few years ago. And as we see our nation rushing forward in this way, in the way of rebellion, in the way of overturning your principles, your foundations, your plans for a peaceful and prosperous nation, we know that there is a great challenge to be faced also by your church. To to face it with confidence in the knowledge that you bless, to face it in the confidence that you will provide through your word and spirit all that we stand in need of to battle against the principalities, against the uh, enemies of of this uh, darkness, this spiritual realm with which we have to do battle, that your church will not be forsaken or left to herself, that you, Lord, will not allow the gates of hell to prevail against her, and that if your people, Lord, remain within the safe confines of your church and community, you will preserve and protect them. But we know how quickly, Lord, our young people, our own hearts and minds, our lives are drawn away from the things of your word and will into the empty, meaningless things of this life. And so the devil tempts us to leave the security of the ark which bobs upon the oceans of sin and immorality and security and safety. We know how much the devil wants us to open the door and to allow into our hearts and into our lives, into our church communities and families the immorality of this age so that we might be lost and swept away and so we do pray lord in the midst of all of this that you would save us O lord our god and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise so bless us lord in worship today as well and bless us in this coming week bless every conversation we have with brothers and sisters of the faith Bless us as we open our Bibles around the tables for devotions. Bless us as we offer up our private prayers to You. And hear our prayers, O heavenly God and Father, for You are the Lord, the God of Israel, and Your name is worthy of praise. Indeed, may You be blessed from everlasting to everlasting. Together, Lord, in our hearts, we acknowledge the greatness of Your love and declare our believing Amen to your goodness and grace in Jesus Christ. And lift our voices to praise you for all that you have and continue to do in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And in preparation for the Word of God, we're going to sing from number 373. See the conqueror mounts in triumph. See the king in royal state riding on the clouds his chariot to his heavenly palace gate. The three stanzas of 373 will stand to sing.
before the Lord in a prayer for illumination. Shall we pray? Gracious God and Father, when your light shines, the darkness is dispelled. When the sun rises in the morning, the darkness of the night scatters. And there is light to see, there is light to move, to be involved and engaged in the activities of life. There is nourishing warmth that brings forth the fruit of the field that gives us joy in our hearts. Lord, may that light now shine in the darkness of our lives, in the places, Lord, where we do not see the glory of Your name. Speak to us now that we may bask in the glory of the light of Your Son, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Then turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the first 11 verses, and we're going to read them in connection to what it is that we confess in Lord's Day 18, which concerns the ascension of our Lord and Savior. Lord's Day 18 has four question and answers, 46, 47, and 48. We'll recite the answers to each of the questions after we read together from the second account that Luke provides. Remember that Luke wrote not only the book of Luke, but also the book of Acts. He mentions that at the outset of chapter 1. And Luke, at the end of his gospel account, also includes an account of the ascension. In that account, Jesus arises with his arms lifted heavenward or lifted in blessing above the people, above his disciples as he blesses them from heaven. And we'll see what he records for us now in Luke, or in Acts rather, 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of God. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. For he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. As for the reading of God's holy word, then let's turn in our forms and prayers books or our Trinity Psalter hymnals to page 218, 19, and 20 or to page 879 and 880. Here we find these four question and answers concerning the resurrection, or rather the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The first deals with the ascension itself, and then the second, third, and fourth deal with the consequences or the implications of the ascension. So let's begin with 46. What do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? That Christ, while his disciples watched, was taken up from the earth into heaven and remains there on our behalf until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. But isn't Christ with us until the end of the world as he promised us? Christ is true man and true God. In his human nature, Christ is not now on earth, but in his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is never absent from us. And if his humanity is not present wherever his divinity is, then aren't the two natures of Christ separated from each other? Certainly not, since divinity is not limited and is present everywhere. 
It is evident that Christ's divinity is surely beyond the bounds of the humanity that has been taken on. But at the same time, his divinity is in and remains personally united to his humanity. And then finally, question answer 49. How does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? First, he is our advocate in heaven, in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that Christ, our head, will also take us, his members, up to himself. Third, he sends his Spirit to us on earth as a corresponding pledge. By the Spirit's power, we seek not earthly things, but the things above, where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand, as the Church does believe. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord, I think from an experiential perspective, from a personal perspective, we would probably have wished that the Heidelberg Catechism spent a little more time on the resurrection of Jesus. It doesn't describe for us his resurrection, doesn't tell us how it happened or anything associated with that aspect of the event. It really just asks how it benefits us. It assumes the fact of the resurrection. It doesn't deal with the particulars of it. It just rushes into the application. And now when it comes to uh, the ascension of Jesus Christ, we have not one, but four. Four question and answers that deal with the ascension of Jesus Christ. And the last one itself is a rich vein of theological truth. We could spend the rest of our time. We could probably have three sermons just on question and answer 49. And it ought to challenge us as we reflect on that fact, one for the resurrection, four for the ascension, on why it is that that is the case. Why does the catechism and the authors of the catechism devote so much time to this question? The answer is, at least in part, the historical circumstance in which the catechism was written. Uh, there is, especially in question and answers 47 and 48, a reflection of a theological issue that was troubling or being dealt with by the churches in those days, and the authors of the Catechism take time to settle that debate, you might say, from the perspective of the Reformed faith. We disagree here, if you will, with the Lutherans. It was between the Lutherans and the Calvinists, and we offer the Calvinist answer to the questions here. But it seems to me that there is a more uh, uh, human nature reason for why the Catechism needs to spend four question and answers on the ascension of Jesus Christ and only one on the resurrection. And, and probably, probably it's the reason why uh, on Easter morning, church is full. I mean, church is full. Here, in other churches, people that don't ever go to church during the year will go to church on Easter Sunday. Who aren't there on Good Friday, they will pack the church out on that day. Church on Easter Sunday is a, a, a vibrant affair on the Thursday night when we have the Ascension Day service. Well, it's not as vibrant, is it? It's not quite as exciting and not quite as populated. Now, I understand children and their sleep and that sort of thing. That's understandable. That's certainly not to be denied. But is it possible that our perspective on the ascension, which doesn't stir in us quite the same excitement as the resurrection does, as Easter Sunday does? We get excited about Easter Sunday. We don't get as excited about Ascension Day. Is it possible that the reason for why that is is because of how we see redemption, God's plan, our own lives, the world in which we live, that our narrow, our myopic, our short-sighted perspective, which makes the resurrection exciting, is what makes the ascension boring, when it really ought to be exciting. It ought to be amazing and encouraging. That when we see the grand plan of God as it's revealed in the ascension of Jesus Christ, our hearts ought to ex experience a great deal of comfort, and our desire to praise the Lord ought to 
motivate our worship. The Catechism helps us see that in these four question and answers, beginning with the very first and the details about the ascension. What do you mean when you say he ascended to heaven? And then we're told that the disciples, while his, or that Christ, rather, while his disciples watched, was taken up from the earth into heaven and remains there on our behalf until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. The Catechism reminds us that the ascension of Jesus Christ is, first of all, an historical event. It was seen, it was experienced, it was recorded. There were many proofs, to borrow the language of Luke in chapter 1. The ascension of Jesus Christ didn't happen some private place. It wasn't some mystical event where he just disappeared from view. He just disappeared into the ether. No, they watched him and they stood watching him as the cloud received him from sight. And they were staring up into that heavenly place before the angel said to them, Men of Galilee, what are you doing? Let's get to work, folks. We need to get busy. It was an historical event. And that's important lest we allegorize or mythologicalize the event of the ascension. If we can say that it is some idea that we should have about Christianity and not a real event, then it changes our understanding of what the Bible teaches and of what Jesus is doing. Because Jesus is doing some very significant things. Indeed, that's also what the Catechism reminds us of, that Jesus' ascension is not merely a change of location. Yes, it is that. He goes from earth to heaven. But it is also a continual administration of His grace on behalf of His people, a work that He accomplishes for us in the very courts of God Himself. Yes, Jesus Christ is in heaven, but He is in heaven for you. He's not gone there because now He can relax. The work is done. He can now just wait for the clock to tick down until His next act, which is the return. He can just enjoy a bit of R&R and see when it is that His Father sends Him back. Oh no, He goes into the very place of God's throne. He goes into the Holy of Holies to present Himself on your behalf. To say, I'm here for these people, this congregation in Wellenport. To minister on their behalf. To plead on their behalf. To call upon the Father to favor this people for the sake of My saving work. And not just for us, of course. Not just for us but precisely because the plan of Jesus is so much bigger than us. Indeed, I think this is why we don't get too excited about the ascension of Jesus Christ. We get excited about Good Friday because it means our guilt, our shame, we all have it. We all struggle with sin. We all make mistakes. Good Friday says you're forgiven and our hearts experience peace. We like that. That's a good day for us. On Easter Sunday, Christ is arisen. There is hope. There is life. There is power. You are alive in Jesus Christ to serve and obey and glorify and praise. It's very tangible, very real, very personal. But the ascension of Jesus Christ, not only is it far from view, it is far bigger than just our personal experience. You see, if salvation is just about forgiveness and about getting to heaven, just about you as an individual, if God's real concern in life is that you make it to His courts in heaven, then the ascension is an insignificant event that's just a blip on the, mark, on, on the calendar that you go, oh yeah, I guess today's ascension day. But if you understand what God has been doing from the beginning, then the ascension is a glorious day for the church. Because from the beginning, the plan of God has not been to populate heaven with disembodied souls all floating around playing harps. From the beginning, God said to man, exercise dominion over all the earth. God said to man, I want you to make this planet, this marble floating in space, 
full of my people, full of my children, all praising me. I want you to develop it. I want you to make it glorious and great. I want you to take this reality, this world, and make it sing in praise to me. And the Garden of Eden was the first example of that. The first beginning on that pathway of dominion. And then when man said, yeah, we'd rather not, and decided to rebel against God, God didn't then say, well, that's it. I'm going to curse this place. He came and He said to Noah, I'm going to save this world. I'm going to save it through you the whole world get the animals into the ark i want to save the animals we think only in terms of our souls going to heaven god thinks in terms of giraffes tigers and lions horses cows he says i'm going to save them too and then when he comes to abram he says abram i'm going to bless the world through you i'm going to bless the nations of the world through you Don't you see, from the very beginning, God has said, I have a global perspective. The whole world is in view. All of it's in view. Every part of it's in view. And that's what I'm coming to redeem. For God so loved the world, the cosmos, that He gave His only Son. God loves all that He's made. And He has a global focus in His work of redemption which focus will have in the end a completed, glorious earth praising God in every respect. What God called us to do in the beginning, to populate the earth and to develop it in praise of His name, He will accomplish in the end through His Son, Jesus Christ. But that's going to take a lot of work. That's going to take a lot of work on our Lord's behalf. The cross and the empty tomb, you understand, are just the beginning. Just the beginning. That's not the end of Jesus' work. That just sets the foundation. That just starts the work of salvation. That is the purchase price for the kingdom. But the exercising of dominion begins at that moment. In Revelation 5, we see that John weeping because there's no one to open the scroll to make God's plan come to pass. And Jesus then appears, don't weep, John, for the Lamb who was slain has come and He is worthy. And He has given the scroll and He sits at the Father's right hand and the work begins. At the ascension of Jesus Christ, Jesus, you might say, began to roll up His sleeves and to say, now let's get this finished. Let's get this world to where it needs to be. Let's get this world populated with believers, with children of the Father praising Him. Let's get this world developed. Let's get this world to where it needs to be. God has a much bigger vision for redemption than we tend to. We think about getting to heaven. God thinks about this earth in all of its splendor. And we need to grasp this grander vision of what God is doing. That's what the ascension of Jesus Christ forces us to do. Every time we have an Ascension Day service, every time we celebrate the ascension of Jesus Christ, we're being challenged to see that Jesus' plan is not just for Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons. It's for Monday at work. It's for Tuesday at home. It's for Wednesday in the hockey arena. It's for Thursday with our friends. It is for every area of life. The ascension forces us to put our demands and our visions behind us and to focus on the Lord and His will and work, to say that Jesus Christ has a task that He's completing right now that is better, bigger, and more beautiful than anything I have in store. The ascension calls us to engage in the King's work, to participate and advance His plan of redemption, to realize that Jesus wants something from this world that we should want too, which is all bigger than As long as you're saved, that's all that matters. That's not true. It's never been true. The work of redemption embraces every square inch of God's good creation. So that we ought to see in the light of the ascension of Jesus Christ that every 
business in this congregation is, in fact, a kingdom business that serves to advance the cross and the kingdom of Christ. Our schools are kingdom schools. They are schools where we are taught and trained how Jesus is king of history, math, language, science. Our homes are kingdom homes where children are trained to go out in service to the king. They are all places where the world and where the word rather and will of Jesus Christ is sovereign, but where he prepares us to go out into the world and to claim for him that act of dominion that this is the place where Jesus Christ is to that conquered territory where the victor stands in triumph and to call to the world, join us in celebrating His, the ascended Savior's work. Jesus Christ is bringing all things to their end. We're participating in that. Come join us, O world, in this work. The only other option you understand is cruel and oppressive tyranny. It is the destructive rule of sin and rebellion against God. That's what we see all around us. All around us, the world knows nothing of the ascension of Jesus Christ, nothing of the throne of God, nothing of the plan of the Lord for this world. In the world around us, life is really about self. About what I can get, what I will get, what's for me, and what makes me happy. What makes me happy is the greatest good of all in in our culture. And that doesn't bring blessing. That doesn't bring joy. That doesn't bring comfort. That brings pain and sorrow and misery. And the same is true in the Christian life. When we Christianize that kind of thinking, which is that Jesus Christ exists just for me to make me feel happy, When my life, my time, my money, my efforts, my energies, my health, my wealth, when it is all for me to make me happy instead of for Christ and for His kingdom, then our lives are not rich, then our experience is not wonderful, then our our world is narrow, small, and insignificant. When the only singing we might do is on Sunday and not during the week, not singing hymns, not just singing Psalms, but singing the praises of our God through the use of our talents, when our use of art, when our use of words, when our skills that we've been given are not used to praise God in our jobs, in our classrooms, in our homes, and we fail to see the truth of the ascension. Then with the world, the ascension is something to snicker at. But the truth is, for the church, it ought to be something that we celebrate every day that we get up and say, today I get to serve the King who sits at the Father's right hand. I get to help fulfill the plan. I get to participate in His work. We live under the banner of the ascended King. It gives meaning to everything we do. Not just to our escaping this life and entering into heaven. Now the Catechism goes on to say that that we ought to be comforted and assured by this very blessed presence of Christ in heaven as we labor, as we toil, as we fight in the challenging days of this life. Question answer 47 and 48, we deal with this issue of debate in the time of the Reformation between the Lutherans and the Calvinists. It continues to this very day. And it deals with the question of Christ's Humanity it deals with the question of how it is that an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, a God who is everywhere present, knows all things, how could He come into the flesh and be Jesus? The Lutherans, Martin Luther argued that you should think of Christ, oh, this is a simplification of his argument, but it, it, it's fairly accurate. You should think of Christ's attributes, divine attributes, in terms of clothing. Think of His omniscience, His knowing everything, as being His jacket, you might say, and His being everywhere present as being His tie. So that when He came down to heaven to be incarnate in the womb of Mary, what He did is He took off His jacket and He took off His tie. He laid them down for a moment and He took up limitation, not knowing everything, not even the Son of, God, Son of Man knows when He will return, only the Father in heaven. 
He took up frailty. He took up all of these aspects of humanity. And then when he ascended into heaven, what he did is he took off those things. He took off his limitedness. He took off his not knowing everything. And he put back on his tie and he put back on his jacket. And now he was again gone. So that Jesus in heaven is not the same as Jesus on earth. Well, said John Galvin, well, says the Scriptures, well, says the Catechism. That's not entirely true. In fact, what is the case is that Jesus Christ is not only completely united to His humanity, but His divinity was never limited by His humanity. His humanity was finite. His humanity was limited. His divinity was always omniscient, omnipresent, and in every respect divine. The Catechism confesses that while in His human nature... Christ is truly a man in His divinity. Christ is truly God. And that's never been a real issue for us. Now you say, well, that's lovely. It's a lovely argument for theologians to have. It even comes with a lovely Latin name. Isn't it wonderful? Could we just move on? And we can, but you'd rob yourself of some comfort if you did. If you just skipped over 47 and 48, and didn't really sort of dig into the soil of those things, because this is hardly a minor theological matter. It is, in fact, a rich vein of comfort for a church, especially like ours, that lives in an increasingly hostile world. We may not always be concerned about doctrine. We may not always want to argue about theological matters. We tend to get frustrated because it brings about division and, and tensions between people, but But if we do it with respect and if we do it with our hearts and minds open before the Lord, the payoff is great and encouraging and blessed for us. When we listen carefully, we find ourselves strengthened. This is the problem with not paying attention to substantial truths. This is the problem with the way our world is increasingly becoming. When we scroll through our social media feeds, our minds and our ability to listen and understand reduces, 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 reduces. If you talk to some of our, especially some of our older teachers, I'm sure that they can tell you that they can see from a generation ago to now, the ability of students to pay attention and think has become extremely small. I hear now it's down to about 10 minutes. That in 10 minutes, a teacher can communicate something after that. The minds of the students have wandered. Well, where that's the case, and the devil knows what he's doing, we're not going to be able to think deeply about theological matters. We're not going to be able to dig deeply into the foundation of God's Word. We're not going to be able to pour a solid foundation for our faith. And we will find in the storms of life that we are very quickly overrun. And storms are a reality in this life from personal struggles to philosophical struggles to congregational struggles. There is no end to the ways in which we are under assault by the enemy that wants us to falter and fail. The enemy seeks to disrupt us, to push us off of our foundation, to keep us off of the rock that is strong enough to stand against the very forces of this world that are railed against it. If you stand upon the rock that is Jesus Christ, you are absolutely and utterly secure. The devil knows that, so he wants to get you off of the rock, out of the church. He wants to get you relying on yourself. If he can keep you from thinking about Jesus, if he can keep you from thinking about the things of the faith, then he can keep you from knowing the great comfort of Jesus Christ. And our comfort is so rich precisely because our forefathers took the time to debate these things and to work through these challenging truths and to show us how important they are for daily living. For here's the payoff of question and answers 47 and 48. The payoff is that Jesus Christ is with you. He will never leave nor forsake you. He has not forgotten you or despised you. He hasn't put you away. He hasn't said of His humanity, I don't want that anymore. That's not really something important to me. No, His humanity, your humanity, is very important to Him. He keeps it very close. It is who He is even in heaven. If you could go to heaven today, you could shake Jesus' hand because He's there in the flesh. And because that's true, when you lay in bed tonight, and maybe... Maybe you get a little scared in the dark. Sometimes we have that, don't we? We get a little scared in the dark. 
Maybe we hear something. Maybe we hear a branch scratching against the window. Maybe we hear noise on the road. Maybe we hear the house settling and creaking and we're a little bit nervous. What about when we lie in the hospital bed, when we go to that meeting with a doctor where they're going to give us the test results? What about that time when we're at the empty grave, the yawning grave of a loved one? What about those times when we're struggling with a broken marriage? What about those times when we're feeling the shame and the guilt of our failures? In that moment, know this, that precisely because Jesus is in heaven in the flesh, He is with you in His Spirit in this moment to bless you, to guide you, to provide for you, to direct you. He is there because He loves His body, the church. And He will provide for us all that we need. So don't get glassy-eyed when doctrine is discussed. It may be the most exciting aspect of your spiritual life. It gives you the solidity in the midst of a chaotic world to know that the Jesus who said, I will always be with you to the end of the age is telling the truth. And you can rely on it for He is in heaven in the very flesh. In the very flesh that He ascended with before the disciples that day. There is a comfort that we all need and ought to enjoy and experience as we live in this difficult, challenging, and bumbling world. A world that bruises, a world that causes us pain, and a world that that can make us grieve and break under its weight and burden. The Apostle Paul certainly experienced that. Paul knew the grief of this broken world in the end. As he's writing to the Philippians at the near the end of his life, There's good reason for why he then says for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. This is a hard and difficult world. We long for the day when we will be free from the misery of this life. But until then, let us rejoice to know that Jesus Christ reigns at the Father's right hand. Indeed, the catechism ends with a triple blessing for why that is. Obviously, we're going to have to run over these rather quickly We're not going to be able to give them the full treatment they may deserve, but be encouraged. Be encouraged because we have an advocate in heaven. First, says the catechism, He is our advocate in heaven in the presence of our Father. Our Father who rules all things, who governs all things, who created us, to whom we owe allegiance, before whom we are to give our lives as living sacrifices of praise, our Father who judges us, who commands and calls us, before whom we must give an account. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of that living God if you fall into the hands of that God as a sinner. If you are not covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you you try to enter into His presence on your own, then like that guest at the wedding feast who would not put on the wedding garment, you will find yourself in the outer darkness weeping and gnashing your teeth. But praise be to the Lord, there stands before the very righteous and holy God whose piercing brilliance condemns all sin before it ever comes anywhere near His presence, between us and that glorious light is Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one who died, who in the flesh, with His wounded hands, wounded side and feet, stands before the Father and says, for my sake, hold not against this one the sin that they have committed. Indeed, says Jesus, for my sake, provide this one all that they need. When you pray to Jesus Christ and you ask Him to bless you in whatever way, then He is the one who comes to the Father with that prayer before Him. He says, Father, for the sake of this member, for the sake of this child, answer this prayer. And if the Father were then, He would not, of course, but let's pretend, say, why should I bless that one? Look at all the sin they've committed. Look at all the things they've done wrong. Then Jesus would say, for my sake. For my sake. 
The Father, of course, loves us perfectly in Jesus Christ. He never thinks to do us harm, precisely because Jesus Christ stands before Him as our advocate, presenting Himself on our behalf. Who better than the Son of God to present to the Father your prayers, your cares, your concerns, Such an empty thing when you see people, when you hear of people, Christian people, praying to saints, praying to Mary and the rest. They have the very Son of God as the door through whom they can enter into the presence of the Father boldly to lay their their petitions before Him. And they think they need to come around through some lesser, some more insignificant character to try and win God's favor. No, no, we have an advocate in heaven. But we also have our own flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that Christ our head will also take us, his members, up to himself. Here's one of those things that we sometimes struggle with. How do you know that you're going to go to heaven? Not so much how do you know that you're saved. Not so much how do you know uh, that, that you're a, a believer, that you're a member of the church or that sort of thing. But... If today you should die, if today the Lord should call you to stand before Him with the pearl gate open to you, how do you know you're going to heaven? How do you know you'll be received in the very courts of the King? Well, the answer depends on who the gatekeeper is. In all of the jokes that involve people dying and getting to heaven, the gatekeeper is Peter. It's always Peter because Peter was given the keys of the kingdom by Jesus, Matthew 16. So Peter's the gatekeeper. But the book of Revelation teaches us that it's truly Jesus Christ. He has the key of David upon his belt. He has purchased us and he has gone ahead of us to unlock that door so that when we follow, we will be able to enter in. How do you know that you will be received in heaven? That your soul upon the moment of your passing will enter into the very glorious courts of the King? The answer is because Jesus ascended ahead of you. In His flesh, you're being united to His flesh. He went up to heaven and now He is waiting our coming on that day. How do you know that Jesus Christ or that you will uh, be welcomed into heaven? Because Jesus is in heaven. It's also the reason we don't believe in, one of the reasons we don't believe in soul sleep. This idea that when we die, we just lay in the grave and fall asleep. We don't really know anything until Jesus Christ returns. You know how you have that? You go to bed tonight, the next thing you know, the alarm's going off. You don't really notice anything in between. There are people who argue that when you die, you fall asleep. And then when the next thing you're going to hear is Jesus Christ's trumpet call. And you won't know what happens in between those things. No, 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 says Jesus. He, I've ascended into heaven. I am in heaven itself. And I've gone there to prepare a place for my people that they might enter in with me. For good reason, he said to the criminal on the cross, on this day you will be with me in paradise. How do we know? Because Jesus ascended. And how do we know that any of this is true? What's the evidence that this is at all real? How do you know that I'm not just spinning you a yarn, that I'm just not making this up? Where's the proof that Jesus Christ's ascension is everything I've said it is thus far in this message? The answer comes in the third blessing that we are given. For third, He sends His Spirit to us on earth as a corresponding pledge. A corresponding pledge is I'm going to leave this to assure you that I'm going going to come back. It's like a down payment on a house. A down payment on a house says to the bank, these people can make enough money. They can save enough money. They can do things financially that will ensure that they can pay their mortgage. It's proof that you are who you say you are, that you are able to do what you say you'll do, that you will keep your word. Jesus Christ gives us a promise. That promise comes with a down posit, a guarantee that the fuller blessings are ours and will surely be experienced by us. That assurance is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who works in our hearts so that we are born again, who works faith in our hearts so that we repent and believe in Jesus Christ, who works in our lives so that we give ourselves more fully to living for the Lord. 
Do you love the Lord? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you desire in this day and in this coming week to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand that that's not normal? Do you understand that's not a natural experience? We are not born that way. That is a work of God. That is a supernatural, spiritual work of Jesus Christ. And that's the proof that you need. That is, that the Spirit of Christ is at work within you. And being at work within you guarantees that Jesus Christ, who's given you the Spirit, will now also give you all that He's promised. Indeed, here is the greatest comfort of the ascended Savior. Security, ultimately, in Jesus Christ. Security, knowing that God the Father is pleased with us. Security in knowing that we can die in the confidence that we will be welcomed in heaven. Security in that we know that all of the blessings that the Lord has promised, the new heavens and the new earth, will be ours as surely as He has poured out His Spirit in our lives. Which is to say that when we fail to think of the ascension of our Lord, we fail to know this great comfort, we fail to know this glorious work of redemption, we fail to rush to Him in prayer when we are in need. We find ourselves doubting our eternal security and questioning our belonging, our standing before the Lord. We fail to recognize that God is busy at work with us every day. That is to say, we rob ourselves of the comfort that is ours in Jesus Christ when we fail to see the ascension. And maybe that's, of course, what the devil wants. That's why the devil gets us all excited about Good Friday, gets us all about good, excited about Easter Sunday, which we should be excited about undoubtedly. And then he says, ah, ascension, the global ministry of Christ, which guarantees your comfort, which assures your eternity and your strength as you serve in this fallen world. No, 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 no. Don't pay any attention to that. That's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Don't pay any attention to that. Don't worry about that. Don't think about that. It's a Thursday night. You're busy. But the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the source of our great comfort. Is the assurance to us of our eternity is the strength of our daily service within His church and kingdom. The ascension of Jesus Christ is for us a worthy blessing and of praise to God. So it's a good thing the catechism spends four question and answers on it. We may want four question and answers on the resurrection and that's fine, but it's at least good that we have four on the ascension of Jesus Christ. That we can be reminded of how good God is, how secure we are how global is our mission as we serve this lord today let's thank him for that in prayer gracious god and heavenly father we come before you to thank you to thank you to see that we can see christianity and the call that we have as more than just soul winning we are grateful for soul winners we are grateful for those who come to faith and join with us in the praise of your name and submission to jesus christ lord but Not all of us are missionaries, not all of us are evangelists, but we are all citizens of Christ's kingdom. And whether it's when we make our meals, whether it's when we make our homework assignments complete, whether it's when we work on the job site, work in the office, there Christ plants the flag and says, this is mine, bend the knee here. Use your gifts and talents and praise to my name. Help us to see that, Lord. Help us to see the global focus of your ministry. And help us to engage in that activity, in that ministry, knowing that we will face opposition, knowing that we will face challenges, knowing that we will face burdens, but knowing that we do so under the care of the ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, who pleads at your right hand on our behalf and who gives to us such grace and strength that we can know that our lives are eternally secure And that we are equipped, we are given your spirit so that we will be able to say what we need, to do what we need to, to witness how we are called to. So bless us, Heavenly God and Father, in your grace and goodness, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And our song of response is, Christ above all glory seated its abbot's lay. It's a lovely tune. We'll sing the three stanzas of 372, and we'll stand to sing.
opportunity to give in our gifts and offerings, following which we'll sing our doxology, 563. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.